Hello everyone, this is Dr. Zizzy again. Sorry it's taking me a little bit of time to get the podcast up and going, but hopefully you take some time to check out uh, each of the chapter podcasts. You can expect them to last anywhere from 10 or 15 minutes till about 30 minutes for each chapter. And while they're not any attempt to explain every single concept in the chapter, what I've tried to do is highlight some of the most important concepts or theories that I think are most useful to the practice of sports psychology. Now for studying for your reading quizzes, you'll still want to be comprehensive uh, in your studying for each chapter because I will cover more content that will be outside of the podcast. So if you have any questions about something that may or may not be relevant on the reading quiz, you can just drop me an email and I can tell you whether you need to pay close attention to that or not. So let's go ahead and get going. The first chapter really focuses on the profession of sports psychology. Um, the type of questions we try to answer uh, as researchers, and then some issues with professional practice. So let's have a look. I'm assuming for many of you this is your first exposure to sports psychology. And uh, if that's the case, then you're probably not that familiar with uh, exactly what we do, the type of jobs we have, uh, who we work with, and what we spend our time doing. So I'm going to try to explain some of that, and I'm also going to try to highlight some of the professional organizations that are... um, affiliated with our field so if you want to get more familiar if you want to join then you get a lot more information obviously Um, the two primary objectives of sports psychology would be first to understand the effect of psychological factors on physical activity or sport performance so this is the one where you classically think of sports psychology of someone choking or they weren't confident that's why they didn't do well or they had a bad day in their relationship. And so you want to understand all these psychological issues and how they have an effect on performance that day, the next day, the next week. So it could be something related to stress, it could be negative self-talk, being depressed. So there's a mix of issues that would be considered clinical issues such as depression and severe anxiety and relationships. Uh, and eating disorders and other psychological issues Uh, and then there is a variety of others that are non-clinical you know not feeling as confident not being well prepared not having a good um, training plan so you're not feeling the proper way and then what are the impact of those issues on performance right now today in two hours in ten hours in two days in, in ten days and how do you help athletes manage that so they can have an ideal performance Uh, So that's be one area of expertise uh, for a sports psychologist. The second would be uh, more of a prevention standpoint, or what are the effects of participating in physical activity or sport on psychological factors. So one of them is psychological factors on sport performance. The other is sport on um, sport or physical activity participation. Now, uh, the course you will take or maybe already have taken, SEP 383, deals with this second question a lot more comprehensively. Um, then then will uh, SEP 272. So 272 focuses on this primarily, number one, but we'll also touch a little bit on this, particularly as it relates to uh, stress in, uh, in Chapter 4. So the two big overarching questions. So you'll find that sports psych applies to a lot of folks. I mean, one of the most common myths is that it's only for elite or Olympic athletes or professional athletes. And you know, frankly, it's uh, it's much more applicable the younger the athlete because it's so much easier to teach an athlete some of the skills that are sports psych in nature when they're younger, um, and it allows them opportunity to learn that. And then hopefully by the time they get into high school or college or a professional setting, it's already they have a nice foundation. Um, if you are working with a college athlete or a, or a higher level athlete who has already a significant pattern of maybe negative behavior or negative thinking, it can be a very difficult pattern to change. So, you know, working with children, uh, working with younger athletes can be a very effective approach. But a lot of the sports psych stuff really applies to everybody. You know, it not only applies to different levels of athletes, you know, that you might see here. It also can apply to exercisers. It can also apply to those with disabilities and also those who are working with these populations. So uh, I've done a good bit of work with coaches with um, certainly with teachers done a lot of work with personal trainers and physical therapists and athletic uh, trainers that would be another thing I would add to this list would be athletic trainers so anyone who's working with this population we have a role in educating them and helping them understand how psychological factors affect um, the issues that they're dealing with 
and uh, many of us will be experts in in, uh, in helping those almost like a professional development setting for coaches teachers uh, physical therapists etc so it really has broad applicability so try not to think of sports psychology as only for um, a narrow population of elite athletes it can really have a broad role you know in sports psychology you'll find that we will have a mix of roles that will typically include these three issues teaching research and consulting now in my job which is probably one of the most common jobs a sports psychologist would have working as a professor I spend about half of my time doing teaching um, of course that's what we're doing right now uh, I spend another maybe 30 to 40 percent doing research and trying to understand the the evidence and the behind some of the things that we're doing and then I spend another 10 to 20 percent doing consulting so for me as an example I teach courses like this introductory sports psychology I teach more upper level courses as well in exercise psychology and the psychology of injury and then I teach at the graduate level as well I teach things like statistics and research methods and then all of the sport and exercise psychology courses as well so it makes up a good 40 to 50 percent of my job teaching um, research I have done a lot of work across um, areas in sport and also in exercise and a lot of the research that I'm doing right now with some of my colleagues relate to uh, exercise motivation and weight loss so we have a large project going related to uh, helping adults in West Virginia lose weight and I'm able to transfer some of my sport knowledge over into the exercise setting and so for the research that means reading a lot of papers uh, journal articles and then also writing book chapters journal articles and other things to make sure that the material and the messages get out from a consulting standpoint uh, I've been working with athletes or exercisers since about 1995 so that puts me at about 15 years of consulting experience uh, with a variety of different athletes across different sports different levels of sport and I've also worked with a variety of exercisers trying to help them start um, healthier lifestyles uh, and help folks lose weight or change their diet so mine would be a fairly typical role uh, and I have a blend of all three of these now some professors or some sorry some professionals may be purely consulting they, they're going to spend maybe um, 80 to 90 percent of their time doing consulting have a private practice and then maybe they teach a class on the side and do no research so there there are some professors that will be much more applied in nature and then there would be some professionals that are more research and teaching and do very little consulting but you'll find typically that all sports psychologists regardless of their orientation are trained to do all three of these tasks and the majority of sports psychologists are employed in university context or in private practice the two primary uh, types of training that sports psychology professionals um, get would be either focus on a clinical path or on an educational path sports psychology path the differentiation here is that clinical sports psychologists will be trained typically as a psychologist that would be a counseling psychologist or a clinical psychologist in a program that is accredited by the American Psychological Association and that training is very broad uh, it is typically at the PhD level and they will be trained to do deal with all types of therapeutic uh, issues related to um, the general population along the path they might also complete a master's in sports psychology or exercise science so they would have maybe 25 percent of their training in sport and then 75 percent of their training in pure psychology it's a very strong training uh, and then they would become licensed as a psychologist the other area in which I would fit in would be called educational sports psychology uh, I wouldn't typically be a sports psychologist because uh, psychologist is a protected term uh, it's a licensure through the American Psychological Association and through the, each state in the in in the US educational sports psychologists have about 75 percent of their training particularly in sport and exercise psychology usually through um, a physical education department or one a college like ours here at WVU physical activity and sports sciences and then they have about 25 percent of their training in pure counseling or psychology so they're uh, typically more likely to be an educator, a professor, a teacher, and less likely to be a pure therapist or counselor. And the main association for folks that, um, that I work with, and really even a lot of these folks would be members of ASP, um, would be the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. So I want to take a moment and see if I can show you this website here. 
Let me just bring this up for us. There we go. So I'd encourage you to have a look at um, at this. You can dump this in a Google engine, of course, if you want to check it out. I'll show you the web address here. You can just check it out from the top. There you are. It's AppliedSportPsych.org. Uh, you could also put ASP online uh, in, in your browser and it will come up. So you can see uh, from the website, this is a, the organization now is about 25 years old. Uh, there are approximately 1,200 members worldwide. So it's a fairly small field. It's a very small specialty in terms of psychology. is an enormous field in the United States. But sports psychology is a very narrow um, sub-discipline of that. And you'll find all kinds of different things here on this website if you wanted to check it out. There's a variety of uh, informational pieces available uh, for free to educate consumers you know whether they be a professional like me particularly athletes and then you can see that the topics cross over between sport and exercise settings so even though it's the association for sports psychology it really is sport and exercise there's a variety of um, resources for certified consultants which is the main credential um, myself Dr. Clement Dr. Shannon we're all and Dr. Watson were all certified consultants through ASP which suggests that we have uh, the uh, training and experiences to work with athletes on an applied capacity and you can go check out what the benefits are here and how to become certified and you can check out some of the websites of those around the country that are certified to see well, who's out there practicing who is um, potentially a legitimate professional so I do encourage you particularly if you're a student that is going to major in sports psych thinking about a career in sports psychology to spend some time on this website and in particular uh, think about joining as a student member uh, so that you can, there's a variety of free publications and and of course conferences uh, there's a conference each year um, for ASP and a lot of us here from WVU will be going and we typically do take undergraduate students with us uh, if they want to go so if you have more questions about ASP certainly let me know I'm a big proponent of that I would encourage you to get involved so let's continue on a little bit and have a look at there's a variety of information on um, how we get collect information in sports psychology uh, almost like a review of research methods and there's a there's a discussion and a variety and a lot of information comparing scientifically derived knowledge to professional practice knowledge and uh, so you should be familiar with the steps of the the scientific and the different types of research uh, but in your first chapter focus more on the professional um, organizations the, and the, the information that I have presented earlier in this podcast. So scientifically derived knowledge which is, is typically done through experiments is a very reliable, it's a very controlled uh, type of knowledge that is collected in a laboratory setting. So we might bring athletes in to a consulting room and expose them to uh, a particular intervention or technique and then we're going to go back and, and ask them to come back in and measure what the impact of that was. So it's it's a very slow process. You try to control one piece of it so you might give 10 athletes the intervention, you might give 10 athletes a, a control and they don't get exposed to the intervention and then you try to see whether or not the 10 athletes who, um, who got to experience the intervention the sports psychology intervention, did they improve their performance, did they get more confidence, so you do a very uh, controlled uh, conservative study and uh, that's not necessarily the most practical um, but it's it's meant to build knowledge over time in a very slow and controlled way so that we can show evidence that things work in, in, in different contexts. Professional practice knowledge is you really just study almost like a case study well, did this work with this athlete and you let it you let them go out and, and try and hey this person had a really good performance at the Olympics what did they do you ask them questions you do an interview and uh, it's a very immediate and, and it looks at all the different factors but it's also more susceptible because if, if you're having uh, if you're doing interviews and it's more susceptible to bias and uh, it's less reliable because that particular uh, situation is taken out of context and you have very little control as a researcher so Everything we know about sports psychology comes from a blend between science and practice. And it is ultimately a very applied field because we're studying athletes not typically in a lab but at the practice facility, on the turf, um, somewhere out in the field. And so we, you know, the type of research that we do here at WVU is typically a blend of both. We're going to 
do uh, controlled experiments and we're also going to do professional practice knowledge uh, as well and so you just want to be familiar with the uh, characteristics of both of those uh, in how we're collecting information because ultimately uh, we are scientists uh, we're not simply straight practice people and uh, much of what I do in my own uh, practice is informed by the science that's been done and so while sometimes students get very discouraged about reading research trying to understand theories honestly without understanding the theories and the research that's been done uh, if you're gonna try to be a psychologist or a sports psychologist you're not gonna be any good at all uh, you'll just learn techniques anyone can learn the technique of how to breathe um, or how to how to um, you know, tell athletes to think positively for example but if you don't understand the uh, the underpinnings of that the theory uh, you won't be any good at all um, you have to understand the, the pieces underneath so basically you need a blend of the science and the practice to be any good in this field other things you need to know to be good uh, will be ethical standards and these are things you should definitely be familiar with um, because psychologists are not coaches and they're not athletic trainers they're held to a different standard of ethics. Um, the first of which is to uh, only work on things that you know and have been trained to do. So competence is an issue where, for example, I'm an educational sports psychologist and I've been trained in counseling, but I'm not a psychologist. I don't do therapy. I'm not going to help you um, get, I'm not going to treat you for an eating disorder, for example. But I would definitely be able to recognize the fact that you uh, are having an eating, you have an eating disorder. It's really disrupting your performance. And then I would make a referral to someone like Dr. Etzel, who's a, a counseling psychologist, uh, so that that athlete could get treated for that eating disorder. And uh, there, there are many issues in which I would not delve if someone was gonna was having uh, relationship issues and needed to deal with a divorce, and there was some abusal, abusive relationship going on, then I would make sure that that person got referred out to the proper therapist. Because I mean, I really focus my own work as an educational sports psych professional in performance issues uh, and so if it goes too far outside of the performance zone and gets into a clinical issue such as clinical depression and eating disorder then that person is going to have a referral to someone else who has more competence um, and so part of that is blends over with these other principles is uh, professional and scientific responsibility not over promising uh, what you can do, being conservative, maintaining good professional integrity, and and ultimately protecting others. I mean, the basic principle is similar to um, being a physician: is do no harm. Your ultimate your ultimate um, guide is: is this going to actually help the athlete, or is it going to make them worse? It's going to make their performance worse. Going to make them worse. So, it really, should be working for the welfare of others. We should not be getting into sports psychology for our own self, to make money for ourselves, to um, get famous, to get on CNN or ESPN. Uh, that, you know, some people have done it that way, but that's not necessarily the most ethical way, um, ethical way to do it. And so, respecting privacy and confidentiality is another one. You know, so for example, if I meet with an athlete and it's a conf it's a confidential situation, I'm never going to tell the coach exactly what that athlete said. And depending on the context, I may not even tell the coach that the athlete came to see me because it's uh, it has to be a confidential environment if you're working with athletes or you're never going to have the trust. You're never going to be able to help them. You know, there's uh, that rapport and relationship you have with each athlete with each coach doesn't exist without confidentiality. Um so each of these ethical standards I encourage you to check it out and then as you're out there um, looking for things in the field and you're finding you know sports psychology in the news or you're, you're finding a, you hear something on TV I want you to be thinking about is this person qualified are they are they a clinical sports psychologist are they an educational sports psychologist and uh, are they certified through ASP and is this person practicing ethically uh, are they really doing it the right way because there is a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it, as there is probably in most professions. Um, and and this is, these are some of the standards by which we practice and live um, in sports psychology. So hopefully that gives you a good understanding of introduction to the field. And I encourage you to check out all the rest of the podcasts uh, on each of the chapters. And I'll try to get them uploaded as soon as I can. Enjoy the rest of your day.